Figure it out. Hello, this is Adam Korlick with Figure It Out Productions. The following video is part of our quick shoot series. Hey guys, it's Adam here, and welcome to part one of my fourth generation of video game retrospective or recap, whatever you prefer to call it. A uh, little quick history of this series. Um, a, like a while ago, I made a series about the seventh generation of game consoles, the Xbox 360, the PS3, the Wii, after the eighth gen consoles had come out. I just kind of talked about my experiences with them, what I thought as a generation of the generation as a whole, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, not really knowing if anybody would give a crap what I thought. But fortunately, a lot of people really seemed to enjoy it. And then people said, hey, can you do the 6th gen? Which I didn't really plan on, but I was like, sure, I'll do it. And then they said the same thing, 5th gen, can you do that? And I was like, sure, why not? And then now you guys have been asking, 4th gen, 4th gen, where is it? So we're going to go ahead and do it. So this series came exclusively because you guys asked for it. Like, again, I wasn't really planning to ever do this, but uh, since you asked, here it is. Now, this is part one of the series, so it's going to be about the generation as a whole, just kind of discussing, you know, a few elements of the history and uh, stuff like that. And then uh, there will be individual videos about every single one of the consoles you see here. Now, uh, it is worth noting there are some things in this generation I do not have. The first one is Commodore made some sort of, like, PC type of thing that some people call a console and some people don't. I don't even remember the name of it. I think it was, like, CCTV or something like that. I don't have it, and even if I did, I don't think I would include it, so whatever, I'm acknowledging it for anybody who does claim it's a console. Uh, there was a few other random things released only in places like Taiwan. I don't really include those, but sometimes people bring them up. So there it is. It exists, I guess. But I, again, don't have it, nor would I include it if I did. And the one I would include if I did have it is the uh, Neo Geo CD. And usually this is where I would talk about that console, like, briefly, because it won't have its own video. But fortunately for us, SNK made, its, uh, made a, another console in that generation. So, yeah, I'll talk about it then. So this generation as a whole, let's start with some of the history, right? Okay, so this, this generation is so fascinating to me for a lot of reasons, which I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my best to just go over all of them here for you. But um, it depends on the day you ask me, man. But this is either my favorite generation or my second favorite. The competing one, of course, being the sixth generation. The Xbox, the, the GameCube, the PS2, and the Dreamcast. Again, any given day, I'll swap between the two. Now, I think to fully understand that, we need to, we need to go back in time a little bit. Uh, so, the second generation. The Atari 2600, the ColecoVision, the Intellivision, all that stuff. That generation, as I think a lot of us know, blew up more ways than one, and it killed off the industry in North America. And uh, a lot of console, console makers basically said, ah, oh, fuck this, I'm out, I'm not going to make consoles anymore. And in the third generation, Nintendo came in, and they saved gaming, despite how many people gave me shit about saying that before. The truth is, they saved gaming as we know it. Now, a lot of Europeans in particular, not all, of course, but there was quite a few vocals that said, like, hey, you know, the, that didn't affect us in Europe, man. It's so like, not in the short run it didn't, but in a global, global economic sense, yeah, it, it affected you. But think about if Nintendo hadn't came in and saved gaming with the NES, you'd have had the Famicom really only existing in Japan. You would have had, who the hell knows, in North America, and then Europe would have been dominated by, like, the ZX Spectrum and the Commodore, which, both of which, I think, uh, I know Commodore went out of business. I don't even remember who made the ZX Spectrum. I'm just saying, ga gaming was kind of scattered and odd. Nintendo came in and modernized it and really grouped it all in one banner and united the world, essentially, under what gaming was going to be and still is. That's the current model, is that all these companies say, all right, our console is going to come out in all these regions. It may not be the successful one. It may dominate one region and be useless in another, but it's coming out everywhere. So, Nintendo created that, and we have to thank them for that. But uh, at the same time, uh, a lot of cons there were a lot of people that didn't thank them for that at the time. <laughs> um, so, it was assumed by most of these companies that there was no way to compete with Nintendo. They were too much of a juggernaut. Not only was the NES the only thing that was selling, at least in North America at the time, but y y they had deals with developers who said, hey, because we're the only shit that's selling, you have to sign a deal that says, if you're going to make games for our console, you have to also never make games for any of our competition. Essentially a monopoly effect. So a lot of companies like Atari and others didn't want to compete with that. Even, it's weird if you think about it. Atari sat this generation out. They didn't have a fourth gen console. They came back in the fifth gen with the Jaguar, but just sat the generation out. But there were two companies in particular that said, you know what, Nintendo? Fuck you. I'm taking you on. And those companies were NEC with the TurboGrafx-16, 
which also known as the PC Engine in Japan where it was much more popular and we'll talk about it in its video. And of course the one we all probably remember, the Sega Genesis aka Mega Drive. Now if you're like me, if you grew up in the West, if you were a child during this era, this is the fourth gen. This is what you remember, this is what you associate it with, this is what you think about, what you're passionate about. Is the, the death struggle, if you will, between Sega Genesis, Mega Drive, and Super Nintendo. I think there's a lot of reasons for that, and I, I want to touch on some of those. The first is, I've said this before, uh, but I think the reason that this generation and the sixth generation were so good is because they more or less had the third generation and the fifth generation in front of them to kind of, in a sense, sacrifice their lives to make the fourth and sixth gen better. Let's take the third generation, for example. Now, when it came out, it, of course, blew everybody's mind because the advancement over things like the Atari 2600 were astounding. However, it was apparent in the third generation, much like the fifth generation, that the technology was still crude, and it was obvious that the developers had grander vision than what the technology would allow them to do. So they had ideas. They learned not only the programming language, but they learned like what the mechanics were to make a game fun on that kind of plane. But they were limited by the technology of the time. Then they got a big boost. And then they could make some of their best and wildest dreams come true. The same thing, of course, as I've said before, I think is what happened with the 5th gen. That's when they all started learning 3D. And then with the 6th gen, they had all the technology to make those dreams come true. I think that was really the case here. But the difference between this generation and the 6th gen in that regard is that the 6th generation had, you may not fully appreciate this depending upon your age, especially if you're younger is my guess, but the 6th generation really had two technology companies and then two game companies. And of course Sega bowed out very early. There's something to be respected about this generation because you really just had Sega and Nintendo and they were nothing but dedicated game companies. That is all they did. They were not technological conglomerates like Sony and Microsoft. They weren't, it wasn't some subdivision of their company that did this. Their whole company was riding entirely on the success of their platform. And because this was an era before things like, but frankly, the internet, before you had access to YouTube and Netflix and even bonus features like music CDs, now, I, I do want to acknowledge, by the way, that yes, I know the Sega CD eventually gave the Genesis the ability to play music CDs, but since it wasn't really successful, it's hard to say that was a selling point, but we can talk about that later. The only way to win the battle for the living room was to have the best games. If Sega wanted to win, especially against the juggernaut that was Nintendo at the time, they had to make games that were better. And because they had such problems with third-party support due to N Nintendo's horrible contract stuff, they had to just make amazing stuff that would blow your mind. And Nintendo was legitimately threatened by Sega. Like, more so than they ever were prior. Nintendo then said, okay, well, we, we're gonna have to compete. We're gonna have to make even better games. So these two guys were just going at it, head on. Sonic versus Mario, Sega versus Nintendo. It was, it was craziness. The most iconic console war of all time. To this day, it's still a hot topic, man. People will still take sides on which one was better. Now, I had both growing up. But if I had to give you, uh, if I had to answer the question which I preferred, I would say the Sega Genesis. It's my second favorite console of all time, first being Dreamcast. But you know what's the third? Super Nintendo. And it is a hair difference, man. To this day, a, a game company only making games to win your affection as a customer is, is something to be respected. And unfortunately, we really did lose that. Uh, because now we have, of course, extra features they try to market you with, and uh, they're mostly technology companies. Like, granted, Nintendo still kind of does the thing they always did, but I don't know. I just think we lost a little bit of charm in that. I'm not saying modern games are bad, fundamentally, or anything like that, but I just think it was nicer when that's what you had, was just dedicated game companies. Now, um, some other things I'd like to talk about is some of the, the, the legacy of this generation. One thing about this generation that's interesting, when you think about it, is it's the last generation where we all kind of associated gaming with cartridges. Like, you know, obviously there were some things in this generation that used CDs, but fundamentally, it was cartridges. That's what we all thought of. And yes, I know the N64 came later, but all of it, except for the Jaguar, all its competition was CD-based. So really, this was the last time we ever really thought about cartridges, which is kind of interesting. And ironically, it's also the generation that introduced us to CDs. Uh, the first CD platform ever, as far as consoles go, was the TurboGrafx CD, and then the Sega CD. And ultimately, 
the first standalone CD console ever, this bad boy under here, the Philips CDI. I know, right? And yeah, I don't know, it's neat that it introduced us to things like that. But one of the other things that it did, which is funny, is that the competition in this generation was so heated that they had to try, I mean, they, like I said, they were limited. They really could only make better games than the other guy. But it was like a Cold War standoff with these guys. So they had to try anything they could do to compete, which is where famously we got so many damn add-ons. This is the generation of add-ons. Now, in North America and Europe, uh, we, we really associate those add-ons with the Genesis slash Mega Drive, the 32X, the Sega CD, etc. You know, at first Nintendo came out with the Super Nintendo two years after the Genesis and said like, hey, our machine's more powerful. So Sega had to try and one-up that, of course, with the Sega CD. And eventually the 32X, which didn't work out so well in either case. But we forget that in a lot of cases that TurboGrafx had an add-on called the TurboGrafx CD, or PC Engine had the PC Engine CD. Super Nintendo, a lot of people don't know this one. In Japan, it had an add-on as well uh, called the Setel View Box, which actually was like an internet-capable device to a certain extent. Actually, the funny thing about this, when you look at all these consoles, depending on how you define an add-on, every console in this generation had add-ons, except for the Neo Geo AES. The CDI had all sorts of weird like equipment, uh, like you know, it's hard to say how much of an add-on that necessarily is. But uh, it had other, all sorts of strange features. Like even on the back, it's, it advertises things like putting in a digital video card so that it can do all these other things. Uh, the Pioneer Laser Active had uh, Genesis ports on it or TurboGrafx ports, depending on if you, you know, wanted to change the add-on. You could also you could put an add-on for a karaoke device. Again, we'll talk about that in its own video. But isn't that strange? It's just the generation of add-ons because they, they had to find something else to try and compete with, and yet, what it ultimately boiled down to was just some of the best fucking games ever made. I mean, to this day, I could still play, especially these two, and just be, I can just be, I can have so much fun with that shit. I just think it's so phenomenal, the games we got out of these two consoles. And uh, I, I just think that's great. It, I'm not, it, if you don't care about like, oh, the graphics aren't modern enough, it's like, dude, who cares? The gameplay was but uh, yeah, guys, in a nutshell, that was the fourth generation. Um, it's a really exciting one, and I'm really looking forward to talking to about all these consoles individually as we go. Um, so stay tuned for uh, part two, which will actually be the TurboGrafx-16, uh, aka PC Engine. And uh, yeah, that's it for now. Uh, thank you guys for watching, and uh, I'll see you all later.